Since the dawn of time, man has been curious. And for almost as long, the Vibes Broadcast Network has sought the truth. Investigate. Discuss. Explore. Okay. Maybe in other episodes, but this one is just... Listen to the Vibes. The views and opinions of our guests may not necessarily reflect those of the host or the Vibes Broadcast Network. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Listen to the Vibes. And I have here Mr. Gary Wolf, and most famously known for uh, it was Who Censored? Who Roger Censored Rabbit. Roger Rabbit? Yeah. Yeah. And then adapted into Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And right. uh, plus, you have a bunch of other things that you've written and would like to talk about today. And, sure. Uh, but first off, let's just talk about you. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, um, I, I grew up in a, a very small farm town out in Illinois. Uh, the population was 1,400 people. And um, that's really where I got my start writing. And I got I kind of backed into that. I, uh, I was in the, like the second or third grade. I can't remember which. But whichever one it was, my teacher gave the class an assignment. And she said, here's a picture, and I want you to take this picture home and color it and then bring it back in the morning. And the whole object of the exercise was to stay inside the lines. That was all you had to do, stay inside the lines. So I took that picture home and I started coloring it. And um, I mean, I was better at staying inside the lines than anybody. I mean, I was great at staying inside the lines. So, but I'm looking at that picture and it was it was a typical farm scene like she gave us a picture of the kind of thing we saw every day there was a farmhouse there was a um a fence there was a barn there was a, a big meadow and then there was one cow all alone all by itself out in the middle of that that, that field and so i colored the farmhouse yellow because that's the color farmhouses were in my town uh, i colored the barn red grass green fence brown you know perfect inside the lines and i come to the cow and i'm looking at that cow and my mother had always told me that when people are alone that they get sad they get lonely and they get blue and i'm looking at that poor cow all by all by himself out there in the middle of the field and i said that's a sad lonely cow so i color that cow blue Right. So the next next day I, I turn my paper in and the day after that, the teacher hands them all back, all except mine. And she says, Gary, she says, you come up here to the front of the room she says, and, and you face the class. I think, oh, my God, I colored inside the lines better than anybody. And she held that that picture up over my head and she said, class, she said, look at this stupid, stupid picture. She said, everybody knows that cows are brown, cows are black, cows are white. Sometimes cows are brown, black, and white, all three. Never, never, never are cows blue. She's Gary, don't you ever do anything that stupid again. And she called my mother. And my mother had, had to come to school, which was a big deal for my mother. And the teacher said, I think there's something wrong with Gary. I think he might have to go to a doctor and have some psychological help because he's coloring cows blue. And there's no such thing as a blue cow. So, you know, my mom comes home from the school and, and she gets my dad and, and they bring me into the living room that night. And they, my mom said to me, she says, well, Gary, why did you color that cow blue? And I said, Ma, you know, it wasn't me, it was you. <laughs> you were the one. You, you told me, you know, people all by themselves, sad, lonely, they get blue. I said, there's a cow all by itself, sad, lonely. I call her the cow blue. It's, it's you. And so she said, well, you go outside and talk and play because you, your dad and I have to talk about this. So I go outside and I, I really didn't think this was going to end well because uh, you got to know my folks a little bit. They uh, they were children of the depression. They grew up in hard times. Right. My dad, my dad had to drop out of school in the third grade to go to work. And my mom had to drop out of school in the eighth grade to go to work. So 
these were not what you would call highly educated urban liberals. I mean, <laughs> these were hard scrabble working folk. And uh, I didn't think this was gonna have a happy ending for me, but my mom called out and she's Gary, she says, you come back in here. So I came back in and she sat me down and she said, okay, your dad and I talked about this. And we decided that the next time you wanna color a cow blue, you go ahead and color a cow blue. And, and that was the first validation I ever had of creativity. So my mom actually went back to school and talked to the teacher. And she said, look, next time he does something like that, let him, let him do it. And so uh, two weeks later, we got another assignment. And the assignment was to write one page about what you did on your summer vacation. And so all the kids were writing. I mean, this was in Illinois and they were writing off. Uh, you know, we went to Wisconsin, uh, somebody went to Indiana. And so I wrote my one page about how I went out in my backyard and I used tin foil, tin cans and, and string and a few rubber bands. And I built a rocket ship and flew to the moon. And the teacher just handed it back the next day and said, well, that was an interesting trip. And I <laughs> never, never bothered me again. So that was really the start of my of my writing career. The, the the other things that influenced me when I was growing up, um, and again, this is my mom. Uh, my mom said, well, my dad, my dad ran the pool hall in that town. Mm -hmm. And my mom worked in the school cafeteria. And my mom said to me, you know, if 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 you want to grow up and you want to get out of this town and you don't want to wind up owning and running your father's pool hall, the one thing you can do to make that happen is to read, you know, read, read, read. Right. And so I, I, I read, but you know, good mother that she was, she never put any restrictions on what I could read or what I should read. So, I mean, what did I read? Well, I read comic books, you know, I didn't work that. I, I'd read all I could and I'd go down to the B street smoke shop and read all I could on the stand, on the shelves before he threw me out. And then I, use my allowance to buy some more and I trade them with my friends and uh, I read comic books. And uh, the other thing I read was something that my dad read. And these were very popular in the fifties. Uh, I, I don't think they have them anymore. They might, but I, I don't think so. Uh, they were called true crime magazines. Mm, they, yeah. they, were, they were magazines and they wrote stories about true crimes. And these true crimes were actual, real crimes. Uh, and most often, the, the featured story in these magazines was a murder. So, and, and they were illustrated with real pictures of real crime scenes, real criminals, and real dead people laying on a floor in a pool of blood. And um, if you ever saw a movie called Road to Perdition with Tom Hanks, yes, Jude Law played a photographer who took these kind of crime scene pictures and a guy based on a guy named Ouija. And um, my dad read those. And of course, because he read them, I read them because they were around the house. And again, my mom didn't say, don't, don't read that stuff. It'll rot your brain. I, no, I read whatever you want. So I read those. And luckily I graduated to a better quality of detective fiction uh you know dashiell hammett and uh um you know sam spade uh, mickey spillane mike hammer uh but i i grew up with a love for comic books and cartoons too i mean i used to go to the movie theater and watch cartoons which i consider to be comic books that moved and uh noir fiction so those were my two big loves growing up. Um, wh when I when I got older and uh, I started writing professionally, I wrote a lot of science fiction, three science fiction novels, and uh, Doubleday gave me a contract for four novels, anything I wanted. I could write anything I wanted. So I wrote the first one, which was called Killer Bowl, which is still uh, my most popular science fiction novel. I, I, when I go to a science fiction conference, I'm not known as the Roger Rabbit guy. I'm known as the guy that wrote Killer Bowl. It's a dystopian novel about football played in the future. And I wrote it in 1976. And the future that I selected was 2010, 2011. So 
And I predicted a lot of stuff. I predicted the gas crisis and this, the internet and cell phones and a, you know, a whole bunch of other stuff. But in Killer Bowl, uh, it's, it's played, uh, football is played on the streets of a, of a city over a 24 hour period and is played with weapons um, um, and killing is, is allowed and encouraged. Uh, so I kind of also invented mixed martial arts uh, combat, you know, uh, but that's still one of my most popular science fiction novels. And I wrote one called The Resurrectionist. Um, and I wrote one called A Generation Removed. And um, so I, I, was, I, I was on my fourth novel of my four book contract. And um, I decided I wanted to write something that was outside the box. I mean, I, you know, science fiction was fun. And, um, I, you know, I had become a fairly well-known science fiction writer around San Francisco where I was living at the time. But I wanted to write, I wanted to work outside the box a little bit. So I wanted to incorporate the two loves of my, of my youth, which were comic books, cartoons, and noir detective fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, how do you do that? Well, not easy. So I, I was looking for inspiration on how to do this. And I was watching Saturday morning cartoons one Saturday morning. Um, when my wife came in and caught me doing that, I said, oh, this is pure research. <laughs> you know, honey, I'm, work I'm working on my novel here. I'm not, I'm not just killing time watching Saturday morning cartoons. But I became fascinated not by the cartoons themselves, but by the commercials. Because I, I, I suddenly realized I was seeing cartoon characters, uh, Tony the Tiger, Trix Rabbit, uh, Snap, Crackle, and, and uh, Pop, uh, Captain Crunch mm -hmm. uh, cartoon characters, talking to real kids, and nobody seemed to think that was odd. And I, I said, wow, you know, what a great idea for a novel. What if you had a world? where cartoon characters were real. Mm -hmm. What kind of world would that be? So I spent a year just researching the conventions of comic books and cartoons and what kinds of things went on there that would really be wackadoodle in a human world. Uh, <laughs> there, are, there are a lot. And um, I came up with a story that would only work in a cartoon universe. Uh, I created a hard-boiled private eye named him Eddie Valiant after my father, whose name was Eddie. And um, I wrote the book, uh, it took me another year. Uh, so I sent it to Doubleday and I said, here's the fourth book in my four book deal. Mm -hmm. And I, I, up to this point, like I said, I've written three novels and 60, 100 short stories. I don't know, I lost count, but I never had a reject. I mean, I never got a reject. So I gave him my, my novel, which I had called Who Censored Roger Rabbit? And um, they sent it back and rejected it. And I, I, I told, I said, I called my editor. I said, sure. And I said, what are you doing? I said, this is the, this is the best work I've ever done. I said, I don't think I'll ever do anything this good again. And she said, I agree. She said, this is, this is a wonderful book. It's funny uh, and innovative. Never seen anything like it. it. It's just, it's just mind blowing. It's just so good. It's just incredible. But it's so different from anything you've ever written before. It's so different from anything anybody's ever written before that I had to send it to the marketing department and they were the ones who rejected it. So I said, oh, okay. So I called the marketing department, talked to the head of the marketing and I said, Chuck, why did you reject my book? Who censored Roger Rabbit? He says, oh, we, we all read it. We loved it. That was hilariously funny and really creative. But he says, there's no category for this on a bookstore shelf. He said, it's not, uh, on a, a regular adult novel, it's not a children's book, it's not a regular mystery, it's not a fantasy. It says th there, there's not there's not a category for it on the bookstore shelf. I can't sell this book. I said, okay, what would you do if somebody gave you Gulliver's Travels or Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz? What would you do with those? And he thought about that for a minute. He says, I couldn't sell those either. So. I went to my agent and I said, look, you know, Bill, if, if I can't sell this book, I don't want to be a writer anymore because sure. this, this is what I want to write. He said, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. He says, we'll, 
we'll find it a home. We'll find it a home. And he believed in it. He really did. So uh, he started sending it out to different publishers and uh, sometimes different editors at the same publisher because they had different perspectives and different likes and dislikes. And uh, along, the, along the route, uh, Who Censored Roger Rabbit got 110 rejects. It was rejected 110 times. And um, the, in those days, you used to get rejects by, um, by letter. It would come by letter, by mail. There was no internet in those days, so you'd, you'd get it in the mail in an envelope. And um, my wife used to call my going out to the mailbox every day the daily disappointments. Because I'd come <laughs> back with, you know, two, three, four reject slips. And, um, uh, you know, I was at 110 rejects. And finally, uh, on the 111th submission, it went to a woman named Rebecca Martin at St. Martin's Press. And mm -hmm. Rebecca Martin and St. Martin's Press had no uh, relation except the, for the name. But uh, she had just published a major bestseller for them. And so the president of St. Martin's Press said to Rebecca, okay, the next book that you want to publish, whatever it is, we'll give it to you as a vanity project. You can publish whatever book you want. Mm -hmm. No questions. And just then, who censored Roger Rabbit came across her desk. So... Um, she, uh, she read it and editors all loved it. I mean, editors loved this book. It was always the marketing department that rejected it. So she read it, loved it. And she took it to the president of the company and said, here's the book I want to publish as my vanity project. Who censored Roger Rabbit? I want to publish this book. And so the president said, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to read it. I'll take it home tonight. I'll read it. <laughs> Get back to you in the morning. So he took it home that night, read it, came back the next day, called her in and says, Rebecca, I told you you could publish any book you wanted, but you can't publish this one because I can't sell it. And, and Rebecca, wonderful woman that she was and is, uh, stepped up to the plate and says, look, you published that book or I quit. So they published the book. And uh, they, they published it in uh, very small quantities. They published it uh, in a quantity of, I think, 5,000 copies. And, uh, you know, people ask me, all the time they say you know if you could live your life differently or if you had a time machine and you could go back in time and do something differently what would you do and i i said well if i had a time machine <clears throat> i would go back to 1981 when who censored roger rabbit came out priced at 295 and i would buy all 5,000 copies and i'd put them in a barn somewhere and wait until 2022 when you go on eBay and they're selling for three hundred and seventy-five dollars a copy, and right? It, you're really wealthy, man. So, uh, but basically, uh, they they bought it and they did publish it. Um, and the the time period in publishing in those days was about a year. So they bought it in 1980, and it was scheduled to come out in '81. Um, so it was I don't know a couple of months into 1980. Uh, two, three months, and I get a call at home on my home phone. And the guy on the other end says, uh, is this Gary K. Wolf? I said, yeah, yes, it is. He says, oh, this is Roy Disney from the Disney company. And, and I said, yeah, right. Roy Disney calling me at home on my own phone. That's, that's right. Who is this really? No, oh, no, it's really Roy Disney. And, and I'm, I'm calling to ask if you'd be interested in letting us, uh, make a movie out of your book who censored roger rabbit and i said yeah right the book hasn't even come out yet i know you know how do you even know about it he said, well it turned out that somebody at st martin's had sent the manuscript to the disney company and said hey i think you'd really like this i think it would make a great disney movie and i i've tried to find out who did that i never i was never able to find out because i wanted to kiss her or him full on the lips but um uh, uh i never found out and um, it turned out that they, they did, in fact, really want that book because this was 1980. And in 1980, uh, the Disney company was not the megalith it is today. They, they were in danger of becoming a second rate movie production studio. They were making movies like The Nutty Professor and um, uh, Herbie, the, the Love Bug, and 
yep. uh, the, the the black the black hole and the black cauldron which disappeared down the black hole uh, they were making movies that were going to be the second half of double features and there were no more double features so they were uh, they were hurting they had been offered Star Wars they turned it down they'd been offered ET and they turned it down and they they saw who censored Roger Rabbit live action animation combined as their entree back into the top levels. This was gonna make them a, a key player again. Um, problem was that in 1980, uh, they really didn't have, they didn't have the horsepower, uh, the creativity, they didn't have the technology. Um, they, they just, they didn't have a lot of things it, it was gonna take to make this movie. Right. And uh, they tried and they tried and they tried. And um, at one point in 1983, um, they came to me, Roy Disney came to me and said, hey, look, we're not having any luck doing this as a live action animated movie. So what would you say if we did it with the cartoon characters wearing costumes like they do at Disneyland, you know? And I'm thinking, oh, geez, I'm gonna have, I'm going to wind up with the Disney stable. I'm going to have Fred McMurray as Eddie Valiant. I, I'm going to have Haley Mills as Jessica. I'm going to have Dean Jones as the rabbit and Kurt Russell as baby Herman. I, and I said, uh, <laughs> you, you know, it really compromises the principle just a little bit. And um, so they, they agreed and they went off and they tried it. Uh, I, I really lost hope. I didn't think uh, this was like my 110 rejects. Uh, I didn't think this was ever going to happen because it just, they just didn't have it. Uh, then in 1985, a couple of things happened. Uh, Roy Disney got forced out and a guy named Michael Eisner came in. Yeah. Mike yeah. Eisner uh, brought with him a guy named Jeff Katzenberg and the two of them had worked together at 20th Century and they'd done a whole bunch of stuff like Jaws and, you know, really big deal movies and when they came in they looked at what disney had in production and they canceled all the projects everything that disney had in production <clears throat> with one exception they kept they kept roger rabbit because they knew that this was the movie they had to make right um, so so they did one thing that nobody before them had ever done they brought in an outside producer and they, they brought in somebody from the outside every other producer that had tried to get it done it was an inside disney person they brought in an outside producer a little known young guy just getting his start called steven spielberg right so they, they bring steven spielberg in to produce this movie now um what happens when you bring steven spielberg in to produce a movie well things start to roll i mean things happen and to show you um back in 1980 one or 82 i can't remember roy disney went to warner brothers and said hey look we're making this live action animated movie and um we're gonna have cartoon characters and real people and we'd like to have bugs bunny do a cameo we'd like to have him just come right out and say hey what's up doc and eat a carrot and then go back what do you say the Warner Brothers looked at Roy Disney and said, get lost, get lost. There's no way the Bugs Bunny is ever going to be in a Walt Disney picture. That is just never going to happen. So mm -hmm. five years later, Steve Spielberg goes to Warner Brothers and makes the same request. Hey, we're doing this live action animated movie. I'm doing this live action animated movie. Can I have Bugs Bunny to do a cameo? And Warner Brothers looks at Steve Spielberg and says, of course. Of course, of course you can. What about Porky Pig? Don't you want him? And how about the Roadrunner and Wiley e. Coyote and Sylvester and 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 Tweety Bird and Yosemite Sam? Don't forget Yosemite. That so he got them all. You know he got them all. Um, and the only uh, the only requirement was that Bugs Bunny had a contract, uh, which they actually which an agent actually negotiated and. Uh, in Bugs Bunny's contract, it stipulated that Bugs Bunny was a co-equal superstar to Mickey Mouse. And so Bugs Bunny had to be in every scene with Mickey Mouse. 
You could not have Mickey in a scene by himself. The two had to be together in every scene and they had to have the exact same number of words of dialogue. Okay? And so you next time you watch the movie, you see, you can you can time it and you can count the words and, and they're they're identical. Um so one, once Steve Spielberg uh, got involved, the, the movie started going and uh, they just never looked back. I mean, it just became what it is today. And I, 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 give, I give him credit. I, I give major credit to Jeff Katzenberg because he was in charge of production. And when he came on to Disney, he said, you know, he said, um, and he issued this memo called the Katzenberg memo. He said, you know, what gets studios in trouble is they always go for the home run. And um, he said, I'm not going to go for the home run. He said, I'm going to go for the, for the single, the double, and the occasional triple. I'm never going for the home run. I'm never going to make a movie for more than $14 million, which was uh, on the modest to upper modest level in, in 1980. Um, well, the first production meeting for Roger Rabbit, uh, Bob Watts, who was the producer, said to Jeffrey, well, my preliminary estimate is that this thing is going to cost at least 38 million, mm -hmm. probably more. And Jeffrey didn't bat an eye, he said, do it, just make sure it's good. And the production cost went up uh, 38, 50, 60, 70, finally $78 million. Wow. And, and Jeffrey never once said, hey, it's too expensive, cut corners. It never said that once. He just, he, he looked at the, the finished product and he said, yeah, keep going, do it right. So, uh, you know, I give credit to Steven, I give credit to, to Jeff Katzenberg, especially he was the guy behind the scenes. Um, but one, the first thing that uh, Steve Spielberg did when he came in was he, he brought in uh, a director. He wanted a, a director and he brought in Bob Zemeckis and Bob Z had actually been offered it before. He'd been offered it in 1981, um, but he didn't think that Disney had the horsepower to do it in 1981. So uh, he went off and did, you know, some stuff that nobody's ever heard of, like Back to the Future of Forrest Gump. <laughs> and then he came back and and, uh, and did uh, did Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Um, and and the difference between the title of the book, Who Censored Roger Rabbit and Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Uh, I actually like Who Framed Roger Rabbit better than Censored. Um, mm. uh, but the um, uh, the people at, at Disney and, and at Amblin were afraid that if they put Censored in a title, that people were going to think it was some kind of a R-rated movie. Right, right. And, and if you look at the early logos, uh, you will find that the logo who framed Roger Rabbit, the first logo had a pair of handcuffs hanging off the tail of the rabbit. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was a brilliant, brilliant visual. It's just great. But again, uh, they looked at that and they said, you know, people are going to think this is a bondage movie. You know, some kind of weird <laughs> bondage movie. And uh, you got to remember, I mean, everybody was everybody was was walking a really fine line here. Nobody knew how, whether this movie was going to be any good. Nobody knew whether this movie was going to appeal to children or adults or nobody. I mean, nobody knew if this movie uh, was going to be the... the the, the, the best live action animated movie ever made, or if it was going to be another Howard the Duck. I mean, nobody knew. And, uh, you know, it turned out to be a masterpiece, but at this time, nobody knew. And uh, so when they were looking for actors, um, they, they, wanted, they wanted somebody for the voice of Jessica. And um, so, uh, uh, Bob C had worked with Kathleen Turner on, on Romancing the Stone, and yeah. uh, she was everybody's choice. I mean, her voice was sensational. So uh, she agreed to do it. But again, they did the voices first, and she had no idea whether this was what kind of movie this was going to be. So she agreed to do it, but she agreed to do it without credit, no, no screen credit for Kathleen Turner, which is what James Earl Jones did 
with Back to the Future when he voiced Darth Vader. And, you know, the first Darth Vader, the first Star Wars movie, nobody knew if that was going to be any good. So he did that one without credit. And then when it became a huge success, hey, who, who did the voice of Darth Vader? A mystery man, James Earl Jones. Well, this way, if Roger Rabbit was a huge success, who did the voice of Jessica, a mystery woman, Kathleen Turner. Um, but if it was a, you know, a, a bomb, well, she'd fade it in the background and take it off her resume, I guess. But um, when it came time for her to sing the song, why don't you do right? Um, she was pregnant at the time and couldn't sing. And whether Kathleen can't sing or didn't have the breath control because of the pregnancy, I don't know, but she, she couldn't sing the song. Mm -hmm. And so Steve Spielberg was there with his wife at the time, Amy Irving. And so he said to Amy Irving, he said, hey, Amy, you sang a Yenthal, why don't you give it a whack? And I said, Stephen, nobody's gonna believe that Jessica has one voice when she sings and a totally different voice when she speaks. He says, ah, nobody will even notice. And nobody did. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of screen time that separates the song from Jessica actually speaking. And that, that helps. Uh, but uh, Amy Irving took screen credit. She, uh, if you read the credits, you will see Amy Irving singing voice of Jessica Rabbit, but no Kathleen Turner. Um, the, the other person that uh, um, Bob C. and Stephen had to hire, they wanted a, a, a lead animator, somebody to oversee all the animation for the, for the, uh, the Disney animators. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody wanted Chuck Jones, the guy who created Bugs Bunny. I, I mean, I, I, I wanted him, everybody wanted him. Uh, so we interviewed him and he, he was willing to do it. He wanted to do it. Um, but at the time, I think he was in his late 60s and uh, they, they realized that this was going to be a five-year project, four or five-year project, an intense workload. And they were worried that the, that the stress and the workload might kill him. And so they, they said, no, nah, you know, no Chuck Jones. And that's the first time I've ever seen anybody in Hollywood have the, the least bit of consideration for the welfare of yeah. anybody. I mean, it's usually work them to death. And well, yeah, no kidding. Kick them up. So, uh, so then they, they took a look at Ralph Bakshi, who had done uh, the R-rated Fritz the Cat. And um, Stephen thought he was a bit of a thug. So uh, they, uh, they passed on him too. And um, uh, they, then they settled on, uh, although I, I often wonder what Ralph Bakshi would have done with Jessica, probably what he did with uh, Hollywood and Cool World, I don't know. But, um, then uh, they, they, they came across Dick Williams. Dick Williams was an American who was living in England at the time and had won an Academy Award for the Pink Panther and had done, it was at the time was doing um, commercials for a, a, an English lager, English beer. And he had, it had this, I think it was a cat. I'm pretty sure it was a cat. But in every, yeah, it was a cat because it had nine lives. In every commercial, the cat would, would risk his life and lose it to get this beer and then come back and, you know, he, he, had, he had eight lives left, but he had the beer. And if you look at those commercials, I think you can find them on YouTube. Uh, a lot of the scenes that are in those commercials are scenes that he converted into scenes from Roger Rabbit. Roger Rabbit is doing what the, uh, what the cat did. Um, but Dick worked with me to visualize the characters because I, I mean, I'm a writer and I, you know, I draw stick figures and I, I had described the characters, but I had never, I, I had never, you know, seen them. I mean, I, 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 and so Dick helped me visualize what they looked like. And he drew Roger pretty much like Roger is in the book. Uh, red overalls, uh, the, the bow tie with the uh, with the polka dots, and the, you know the, the eyes. Uh, he added the the top knot because he thought that was a good splash of color. And the one change he did make in the book, the rabbit is a brown rabbit. Uh, he felt that a white rabbit would be better because it would pop more 
on the screen. He felt that a brown rabbit was going to disappear into the background. Right. And, and he was right. So the, the rabbit, the rabbit was, was white. Um, he drew baby Herman exactly as I described him, you know, the little spit curl and the, you know, the diaper and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then Jessica, um, you know, going back to my hometown when I grew up uh, at 1400 people for, for some odd laws of genetics, the boys in my school outnumbered the girls by 35 to one. All right. So, you know, good luck getting a date if you're the president of the checkers club. And so Jessica, when I wrote her was my ideal woman. I mean, she was the woman that I would have dated if I'd have been able to ever get a date or if any girl would even talk to me. Um, so I, I based her on Red Hot Riding Hood. That was a Tex Avery character of the 30s and 40s um, with touches of Veronica Lake, uh, Betty Grable, and Rita Hayworth. And um, Dick Williams got that instantly. I mean, he got that instantly. And he, he conceived and designed her and uh, made her proportions outlandish uh, just, you know, for want of a better term, uh, because he wanted, he wanted other animators mostly uh, to know that Jessica wasn't rotoscoped. And rotoscoping uh, is a technique that animators use, a perfectly acceptable technique where they film somebody in live action mm -hmm. and then trace over that person, trace over it. And a perfectly acceptable technique. Uh, they used it in uh, Cinderella when she's dancing. They used it in Snow White. Um, perfectly acceptable. But he wanted animators to know that Jessica wasn't rotoscoped. So he made her proportions so <clears throat> so ridiculous that there's no way that you, you know you could find a real woman like that. And Jessica turned out to be the hardest character for the animators to draw because they were used to drawing ducks and chickens, and, you know, mice and cows and, and dogs. And here they were being asked to draw, not just a woman, but like the essence of woman. I mean, this was womanhood and they just couldn't get it. They couldn't get how she moved and they couldn't, they just couldn't get it. So Bob Z, um, we were filming in London at the time uh, at Elstree Studios outside of London, because Steve Spielberg likes the food in England, you know, go figure. Uh, we were filming at Elstree Studios, so he went down to the East End or South End or wherever the strip joints were in London and hired a stripper and brought her back to the studio and filmed her in Jessica's red dress, walking, doing the, doing everything that Jessica did in the, in the club scene, walking mm -hmm. down the runway and doing all that. And then he had her take off the dress and he did it in brawn panties. And then he had her take that off and she did it nude. And uh, so that the animators could see how a woman moved, right? And- Probably the best day of their life, right? <laughs> <laughs> I gotta tell you, for, for weeks after that, you'd go through the animation department and you would hear the animator saying, geez, I've been here so long, I work in such long hours. Let's watch the film again and see what a woman looks like. <laughs> so. Um, we did that. Uh, Charlie Fleischer was important because he was the voice of Roger Rabbit. And uh, he was the one who came up with the idea to stutter on P. Uh, Dick Williams and Charlie worked on the voice and Dick Williams felt that um, all major uh, cartoon stars had some kind of a speech impediment. Porky Pig with his stutter and Daffy Duck with his, that it, you know, whatever, Donald Duck, they all had some kind of speech impediment. So they were, they were trying all kinds of stuff. Charlie came up with this stutter on P and, uh, you know, we're great. Um, the other major character and probably the most important character in the movie was, of course, the guy that was going to play Eddie Valiant. And um, everybody wanted uh, Harrison Ford for that. And Harrison Ford, wanted to do it but when he found out it was going to take four years he said i you know, i can't commit four years to a movie so uh we tried paul newman uh same thing and um uh 
tried and then we went out to all kinds of people uh, i mean even kurt russell <laughs> read for it uh, james wood a lot of people and then they finally found the guy that was the perfect eddie Valiant. not only was he was he a you know major movie star he, he was bankable he, he, you know because we didn't know what kind of movie this would be but this guy in the movie this guy's going to bring in this guy's going to bring in people into the seats and that guy of course was bill murray so bill murray was hired to be eddie valiant and it became obvious really early on that uh it, it was up to eddie valiant the, the the actor playing eddie valiant to convince the audience that the rabbit was real and it, it was obvious early on that bill murray didn't believe the rabbit was real you know bill murray would look at him like you're you're a talking rabbit <laughs> what are you doing you're a talking what and so they bought him out of his contract gave him a million dollars and uh kept looking so uh we looked at william peterson who i think would have done a good job uh and then we finally found the guy that was going to be the perfect eddie valiant and that guy of course was eddie murphy right so we bring in eddie murphy and now we got a black eddie valiant it's fine but uh it's an eddie valiant who wants to be funnier than the tunes so we're rewriting the script to make eddie valiant funnier than the tunes and it's obvious that this isn't going to work so eddie murphy gets a million dollars to buy out his contract and a ferrari he got a ferrari too Maybe. and so you start to see how you make money in hollywood you know you never work so uh i'll take that job <laughs> yeah in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime over on the other side of, the, of Hollywood, uh, Brian De Palma is filming The Untouchables, and he really wants uh, Robert De Niro to play Al Capone. But Bobby De Niro is not available. He's got another project going, so he can't do it. So uh, he brings in a British actor named Bob Hoskins to be Al Capone. And after a couple of weeks, De Palma gets a call from Bobby De Niro saying, hey, I wrapped early. I can come over. I can be Al Capone. So now Bob Hoskins has got a million dollars and, and nothing to do. So they said, let's have let's have Bob Hoskins come in and read for it. I said, come on. They said, the guy's the guy's British. You know, he's not just British, he's cockney British. I said, there's no way that he's going to convince anybody that he's the prototypical LA private eye. And uh so anyway, we brought him in and he was standing there on an empty stage reading the lines with a perfect L.A. American accent. Perfect. And he was the only one of anybody who read for that part standing there on a bare stage who made you believe that rabbit was real. I mean, you, you wow. could squint your eyes and you could see the rabbit. He, he was talking to it and he made you believe it was real. And the guy did the most incredible acting job I have ever seen in my life. Uh, when he was handcuffed to the rabbit, it, he, that handcuff is on springs. So when he moved his hand, <clears throat> he also moved the rabbit's hand. So he had to remember where his hand was, where the rabbit's hand was. It's like rubbing your stomach and rubbing your head at the same time. Um, when when he got thrown out of the club by the gorilla and landed in those trash buckets, he broke three ribs. No. Yeah, and we thought, oh, well, we're going to have to postpone shooting for a couple of months while Hoskins heals up. He came in the next day, taped up, ready to go. I mean, wow. just a consummate professional. And, <clears throat> you know, people always ask me, well, do you have any, do you have any regrets about the movie? And I, I, I do. I have one really big major regret and it's that bob hoskins never even got nominated for an academy award for what i thought was the best acting job i have ever seen anybody do in my life uh, and i think the reason for that was he did it so well that um he made it look too easy people didn't realize that there was nothing there was nothing around him he was standing there in the middle of nothing, making it all up in his head. So, uh, so anyway, uh, you know, the movie. Once, once all that, all those pieces got in place, 
uh, the movie the movie progressed. Um, we uh, we released it in um, uh, July of 1988, uh, and they had the premiere at the Radio City Music Hall. Uh, in New York City, so that I wouldn't have to go to LA, so that I could just come down to New York, you know. And um, so I'm sitting up there in the balcony with the VIPs, and on my left is Kathleen Turner, <clears throat> on my right is Amy Irving. And so I'm going to see my movie all start to finish for the first time. I've seen it in bits and pieces, but <clears throat> it really wasn't finished until a couple of days before the premiere so i'd never seen the whole thing I'd never seen i'd never seen my credit so i was going to see my credit up on the screen and i'm sitting there between two of the most beautiful women i've ever seen in my life and i'm thinking to myself you know life just doesn't get any better than this and, and then my golly life got better because kathleen reached over and she grabbed my leg and she whispered in my ear, she says, Gary, are you excited? And I said, yeah, you have no idea. <laughs> Not the way you're thinking. <laughs> so, um, so the movie opened, uh, you know, and for a movie that, I mean, nobody really knew if this movie was going to be any good or was going to do it. It wound up being not only good, but profitable. Uh, it was the it was the best reviewed movie in 1988. Uh, just, uh, critics loved it. Uh, also, the highest grossing movie, it grossed, uh, I believe, $700 million. And um, next year, it was nominated in 1989 for four Academy, for four Academy Awards, won them. And um, uh, I got to go to the Academy Awards where I sat close enough to share to smell her perfume. Um, but for me personally, after that, uh, I wrote the sequel novel, Who P -P -P Plugged Roger Rabbit, where we standardized on the four-piece stutter. And um, we had 10 publishers bidding for that one. Oh, and of the, uh, of the 10 publishers who were bidding for it, all of them had rejected the first novel once. Um, five of them had rejected the first novel twice, and one lucky devil had rejected the first novel three times. Uh, so, you know, validation, validation. <laughs> and uh, I've since gone on to write uh, the third Roger Rabbit novel, Who Whacked Roger Rabbit. Uh, I've written a book of, I published a book of short stories called The Road to Toontown, which kind of collects all the stories I wrote before and a lot of the Roger Rabbit, Jessica Rabbit stories. And uh, within probably two months, I'm coming out with uh, a Jessica Rabbit or Jessica Rabbit Toontown origin story that will show you how Jessica went from a poor shop girl, uh, relatively unattractive, to become Jessica Rabbit, uh, where tunes come from and how Toontown came to be. Man. Yeah, so I've colored a lot of rabbits. I've colored a lot of cows. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I think Kathleen Turner couldn't be too picky. She was in The Man with Two Brains, so. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I love that movie, though, by the way. <laughs> yeah, that, you know, um, I, 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 I you can never understand. I, I can't understand why people do what they do and, uh, you know, why you would, uh, why you would not take screen credit for, something that was being produced by steve spielberg and directed by your buddy bob smekas but uh you know who knows i i i gave up trying to second guess movie actors so you just can't you, you know you just can't yeah that i i see movies like howard the duck and i'm like i, I wouldn't want to be uh mentioned in that <laughs> I, I'm sorry, that was one of the worst movies. And I, I love the comic book, but that movie was I love terrible. the comic books. I love the comic books. And you know, if you want to if you want to go there, uh, there was a TV series called Fish Police. One of the probably one of the worst animated TV series of all time. And the Fish Police comic books were brilliant. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant comic books. So um you know, this is the other thing you learn. You you can't you you can't always trust movie people to get your vision. 
You know, they, they don't understand. A lot of them don't understand. Luckily, Steve Spielberg understood the book and, and read the book when it came out and, and loved it. Bob Zemeckis understood the book and they translated my vision of Toontown, a place where cartoons and humans live. They translated it remarkably well into a movie. Um, you know, they, they, there's the undertone of racism that's in the book that they, that they got and that, you know, is, is in the movie. Mm -hmm. um, and, but uh, I, I've talked to so many other authors, so many uh, whose books were converted into films. And not only was the conversion bad, I mean, these guys disowned the movie, but uh, a lot of them, you know, instead of having the film company fly me to England so I could participate in the filming and fly me to, to New York so I could be there at the premiere, I, I've talked to so many authors who have uh, been barred from the sense of the movie being made about their book. And one guy uh, had to pay to go to the premiere of his own movie. He had to buy a ticket to get in. So no. I, I've got no complaints. I, I have never... I have never said a bad word about Disney, never will. Uh, they treated me really well, and they took my book, which, frankly, I thought was unfilmable, and they made it into a brilliant masterpiece of a movie. You know, so many things have a formula, and a lot of folks don't want to get away from that. And then when something actual original, and they're a little reluctant to take a chance on it, which is why you see nowadays everything is remade from something that's already absolutely been done and absolutely i i i write movies now occasionally i don't really like it i like writing books yeah. because when you write a book you write the book and it's you and your editor and the book is published and when you write a movie it's you and the, the producer and the director and sometimes the director's nanny and sometimes the director's nanny's best friend and um and I, I have been told by by Hollywood executives when I when I gave them a screenplay, they say, "Well, well, we can't do this." And I say, "Why?" They say, "Well, it's never been done before." <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I think people are 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 hungry for something new and original, and just tired of the same old, same old. They're, you know, there's that company, um, Bad Robot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The the uh, the joke is they call them bad reboot. <laughs> <laughs> never never heard that, but it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll have to say this has probably been the easiest interview that I have ever done. I, I get kind of talky every now and then, and I'm, <laughs> and I'm sorry for that. I, no, I, don't apologize. I've been really enjoyed hearing all this, and say you made my job easy. I, I didn't have to come up with anything at all. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, on a final note, uh, two final notes, actually. Um, uh, for more information on all my works and on, on me personally, uh, go to www.garywolf.com. Uh, that's my website. You can buy my books there. And I think everybody should buy my books and everybody uh, should read everything I've written because it's priceless. Um, and and that, that comes directly from my mother. My mother will swear to that. Um, the, the other thing is, I want to leave you with one story. When Steve Spielberg was uh, was making the movie and had gone to Warner Brothers and had gotten the characters, he wanted to make sure that everybody <clears throat> who was a key player in the movie got his or her favorite character. So uh, Bob Hoskins' favorite characters were Heckle and Chuckle. So he went out and he got Heckle and Chuckle. And Bob Z's favorite characters were the Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. I got get Roadrunner and Wile E. Coyote. Um, so he came to me and he said, you know, Gary, what, what's your favorite character? Now I want to make sure I get your favorite character in the movie. And I said, ah, geez, Steve, you know, I got, I got Roger. I got Jessica. I got baby Herman. I think I'm covered. You know, <laughs> I think I'm covered. He says, ah, well, I, I want to do something for you. So we'll do something. So if you... If you watch the movie again, when Eddie Valiant is, is going through the tunnel and he comes out of Toontown and the curtains part and all of a sudden everything's happy and there's bluebirds and you know, they're singing and there's dancing, it, 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 it's on there long. But if you look over to the left, you're going to see 
you're going to see a brown fence. You're going to see a yellow farmhouse. You're going to see a, a red barn. You're going to see a meadow and you're going to see a blue cow standing all by itself in the middle of that meadow. <laughs> I'm actually going to keep my eye open for that. It, it doesn't, it, it's not there long. You don't blink or you'll miss it, but it's there. Well, you know, who framed Roger Rabbit is just one of those movies that people always remember. I mean, I was a senior in high school when that came out and uh, I, I won't say how long ago that was, but <clears throat> you know, I know, I know exactly <laughs> how long ago that was. You don't have to tell me, <laughs> but it's one of those films that I think stands the test of time. Yeah, uh, just, I love just, it. Uh, uh, it was just taken by the, I think it was a Smithsonian who classified it as an American classic movie and put it in their collection and, um it, it'll be restored and remain in their collection forever and i mean it's up there with gone with the wind and the wizard of oz and um great movie yeah I'm, i put it up there with star wars and um uh, step brothers so <laughs> 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 but but seriously thank you so much for your it time it was my pleasure my it, pleasure this was a blast I had a, I had a good time Thanks for, you know, I, all, all the fans out there, I want to thank them all for remembering me and keeping my characters alive. You know, it's, 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 it's been quite a trip. Uh, uh, do you have social media that people can follow? I, I, I'm on Facebook, yeah, and you can, you can follow me on Facebook, friend me. I don't do Instagram, I don't do Twitter, uh, mostly, just, uh, mostly just Facebook and um, uh, my website, yeah. Okay. And I will, I will put, uh, I will put this on my website. I have all my podcasts on my website so you can hear what I've said before to see if I've been telling the truth or not. <laughs> well, thank you so much. It's my great pleasure. Thanks. I really appreciate it. And for those of you, if you are new to the channel, I want to thank you for stopping by and please subscribe, come back. And for those of you who are regular to the channel, thank you for the support. Uh, you're the reason I do what I do. And until the next one, everyone, please take care. Be kind to one another. God bless and peace. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Listen to the Vibes. You can catch us on Buzzsprout or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook at The Vibes Broadcast Network.